Good. Okay, so my name is Jake Whedon, and I'm based here in Shanghai. I've been here for the last 18 years in China, but in that time, I've been teaching and working with kids and training teachers and working with big uh, education institutions. And one of my big passions is teaching kids and parents how to do reading at home. I'm based at StudyCat, and at StudyCat, we make language learning apps for kids. And I am the head of learning experience. And today we're working with Maple to do a cool session for you called Helping Your Child with Reading at Home. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Lauren, for having us. Yeah, thank you so much, Jake. I so appreciate you coming on and sharing your insights with us. Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren Zell. I'm the head of community at Maple. We're a household management app helping you keep track of your family's busy schedule. Um, and we're just going to dive right in and uh, get to it because it's hard enough being a working parent. And hopefully Jake can help us foster a love for reading inside our households for our children. I hope so too. I, I tried that myself. So I have a nine-year-old as, and I know Lauren has an eight-year-old and a six-year-old. So this is very, very relevant to us as well. So let's crack in. First thing I always ask every time I meet parents, every time I'm working with parents is who likes reading? So I'm just going to pretend Lauren is the people I'm talking to here. Lauren, do you like reading? I love reading. I do. I read every night. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the key. I, and we're going to come back to this at the end again. I, I won't get into it much, but it, it amazes me sometimes. I, I talk to parents who want to learn about reading and I say, who likes reading? And Some of them just don't even enjoy reading. So that, that, that's the first issue. If you like reading, you're already a step ahead if you just, as a parent, like reading. And yeah. also, um, if I was in a live event with you and I could see you all, all typing I would say hi Andrea Smith um, who just came in I would actually ask you all how old your children are this session is really focused on kids from you know basically one years old to to 15 years old it doesn't um, but may, mainly probably kids under 10 and I hope this will help you today so what are we going to do I'm going to four things we're going to do a little bit on why we read just two minutes and models and activities that you can do with your kids um, at home and at the end i'll just give you a few final thoughts of, of from me after 18 years of working with um, teaching kids how to read oh and right at the end i'll give you the most important factor that will help you with your kids reading learning journey so you have to stay to the end otherwise you won't get the best my best tip of all so why do we read? <laughs> um, whenever I, I always ask parents this, why get the same answers, right? It's, it's for things like pleasure, knowledge, um, inspiration, relaxation, and for life. These are the reasons that we read. Occasionally, back in when we were in university or uh, we're studying something, we have to read for a test or we read for doing a comprehension activity. But these are the reasons why we read. And the reason I ask you this is because why do our kids read? Now, if your child hasn't started school, they're probably reading for all those things above pleasure, knowledge, inspiration. Unfortunately, sometimes when our kids start school, the main reason that they're reading is for things like this. Yeah. And this is called a comprehension sheet, right? So the idea is that a lot of kids, they associate reading with things like this. And I'm going and <clears throat> I sort of want to get away from that today. I'm not saying that these are bad. You have to do these things. But we don't want kids to think that this is what reading is. The, the one on the left here, the kids will read this and they have to find the answers and write yes or no. Yeah. Actually, you're not reading. What you're doing is you're searching for a word. So if the first one says Mary has got brown hair, I'll just look for brown hair and write yes. I haven't done. I haven't had any pleasure. I haven't learned anything. I haven't had any inspiration. That's not really reading. That's just skimming something on a piece of paper. Same with the second one here. It is useful. It's good skill 
But if the only thing your child thinks that that's really not what reading is. So just keep that in mind that, that every time your child's doing something at school, sometimes they have to do things like this. So I wanted to be that the reason our kids read are for pleasure, knowledge, inspiration, relaxation, and for life. Okay, that was just my why we read. I don't want to spend too long on that today. I thought that was good though, Jake. But, because uh, it's so fun to yeah, read go on, sorry, stories. Go on. I was just going to say, it's just so fun mm -hmm. to read stories to, to our children. But that's what we do right before bedtime. Otherwise, if they're reading, it is in like an educational test-like, comprehension-like way. And that's not as much fun. It isn't as much fun. And then they start to associate reading with having to do something at the end. Now, you should do something at the end, but it should be led by the child, not always led by the teacher or led by you. It let them lead. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we go into the activities, though, I just want to show you a few barriers. So any parents watching or any parents um, who are watching this later, you really should understand these barriers because they are big and, <laughs> and they will interrupt your child's journey. So first thing is what my favorite um, educational neuroscientist is named David A. Sousa. You can all look him up later. But Dave Asus is probably one of the leading experts in teaching kids how to read. And he always says reading is probably the most difficult task we ask the young brain to undertake. I don't think we appreciate that, how much that is. It's your child is learning new words, new grammar, you know, new structures. And then they've got to learn, oh, this is a, a word on a page and then compute that and work out what it is. And it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. So just remember that if they're struggling, it is hard for everybody. English reading takes up to two to four years to become a fluent reader. It's mm. not something you can just learn in six months. Spanish, on the other hand, only takes eight months because they have a much more logical spelling system and Korean only takes three months. But English is hard. Yeah. And then the last one is I've asked many teachers across Asia and around the world, what are the biggest hurdles when you're trying to teach kids how to read? I'm going to show you four things. We're not going to dive into those today, but it would be great. But later, we'll probably have more workshops on these topics. These are the four biggest barriers to learning to read. And all I want you to do today is know them and um, uh, is know them and if you know these four ideas, take a photo or, or save the screen or start looking them up because we'll do things later. So these are the four. The first one is called phonemic awareness. Maybe not a word you've heard before. Mm -mm. But phonemic awareness is the idea that you can break a word down into different sounds. So you have the word cat. It's k a t. Mm -hmm. If you can break a word into sounds, your child will be able to then reconstruct those words when they read we'll do it we could do a whole there is so many fun things you can do with this we could do this another day with maple hopefully and then the next thing yeah. is phonics skills so phonics is now looking at letters knowing the sounds of the letters and constructing them together we should definitely do a whole session on that um, and they go hand in hand because if you can't break down letters and work out how the sounds of things work it's very hard then to learn to read on your own yeah. to have that without that skill. Number three, vocabulary knowledge. If you're lot, if your vocabulary, if you're not really hearing sort of vocabulary that you're going to be seeing in books, then every time you see it in a book, it's a new thing for you. If you've heard it before, you can associate it with something you've heard. So really think about how you can build vocabulary. And the last one is English spelling is just the most difficult spelling probably in the out of all alphabets it's not a clever alphabet it's not well thought out it's a mismatch of of, of german and french and, and 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 roman languages and it doesn't follow rules like we all think it does yeah. um i can just show you one example the wind <laughs> was rough along the loft as the plowman fought through the snow and though he coughed his work was very thorough Oh man, that is so confusing. Being. And 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 this is there are just thousands of examples of this. So we tell kids this is how you spell it, and you know, 
but it, it doesn't follow rules like Spanish or Italian or French or a lot of other languages follow really great rules to make it easy for kids. So you can imagine how tough it is for a kid if they see this. And that's just one example. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, let's get to the fun parts now because we've got 20 minutes. So models and activities for reading. That was all the barriers. Keep them in mind. Think about why your kid is reading and think about the barriers that they have to go through. But now let's have some fun. So this is my favorite model of all. I'm going to read this book to you today. This is a model that I teach teachers, but I, I've taught thousands of parents this model. And it's kind of what we do naturally. So I'm going to show you this model first, and then I'm going to show you some other activities. So this model, you, I will go through it first, and then I'll do it with the book. So the first thing is set a context. So you just think in your head, before we even pick up a book to read, don't, you don't have to start reading the book. Mm -hmm. Today, we're going to do one called um, What Can Tom Do? And they're in a park, right? So before you even pick up the book, I would be saying to my daughter when she was very young, do you like parks? Where's the closest park to our house? Mm -hmm. What can you see in a park? And their brain is already starting to get alive about parks. The technical word is activating schemata, but schema, actually, activating schema. But forget that. It's just that you want to engage your child in the idea. It's like when you walk into a bookshop and I'll go to the history section and I like, you know, maybe you like American history. Before you've even touched a book, you're thinking about American history, right? And right. then you start picking them up. Okay. If, 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 maybe I can do this on the screen as well. I was going to do it on a big screen. I'll go through it first and I'll show you. Then the next thing is you start to ask the book questions. I'll show you an example in a second. Then you predict what's going to happen, and then we read. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that can happen before you've even opened the book, and then we can discuss. So let's try this. I'm, go I'm going to go back to stopping share so everyone can see me bigger, and we'll try this out. So first step is we're just going to set a context. So what type of things, Lauren, would you talk about for a book about a park? Well, we might talk about things that we do at the park. Mm -hmm. uh, different animals we see at the park, mm -hmm. our favorite activities at the park with our perfect. Friends. Yeah, perfect. Then what I say is what we do is with the kids, we say, can you ask the book a question? So we're just looking at the cover now. We're not yeah. opening the book. We're getting them to think about the question. Now I'll start. And I usually start, I go, huh, what's his name? Right. What's his name? Yeah. I'm pretty sure if I open this book, I'll know the answer. Right. But before we've even started, just ask, what's his name? So you ask your kid, ask a question. This works better with younger kids because they're much more open to being, you know, what, what would you like to ask, Lauren? I would say, how, why is he wearing shoes? <laughs> why is he wearing shoes? What are they doing? Where yeah. are they going? Are they, is it, are they having fun? You can ask any silly thing. You could ask, is there an elephant in this book? Is yeah. there a mouse? It doesn't matter. And do you see by doing asking questions, you're handing the power of learning to your child. You're not controlling the learning. They are independently approaching the book. Then the second step is what we call predict. So we have we set the contest. We ask some questions and then we predict. Mm -hmm. What do you think will happen? Right now, you have to be silly, Lauren. Okay. To get your the, the goal is there is no wrong answer. Not like a comprehension question. There's no wrong answer. There's right answers, but there's no wrong answer. So I okay. think the three kids are going to go to the park and they're going to bounce on a trampoline and go to space and they'll be in, and, the, and then they'll meet aliens. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> I was going to say that they're going to play hide and go seek okay. and have lunch. But yeah. I like your version way better. But if you if, if there's any parents, if you be silly enough, especially with your young kids, then you're what you're really doing is you're allowing them to realize it's OK to be wrong about this, but yeah. you're you're pushing their critical thinking. OK, then we start reading. And then after this, I'll start going through the reading. Right. Like I'll show you some great activities. And then at the end, we can talk about the book, put it down and start talking about it. But just remember those three things at the beginning. I'll go back to Sharon. Just remember, if you're going to remember anything, remember these three. There are yeah. three things we can do before we even start reading. Okay, so let's move on. Do you know what's I'm nice, Jake, about mm -hmm. what you're saying is that 
it's making the activity really engaging and active. Mm-hmm. We're instead oh, you wait. of a passive thing, <laughs> we're just like laying in bed and I'm reading to them. Exactly. And that's what I, I think we turn reading to your kids into a full event. And then yeah. actually what you're doing is academically, you, for, so for these three things, what you've actually done is you've encouraged critical thinking, you've encouraged logical thinking, You've yeah. encouraged them to have that independent learning skill and you've gone from now just being, you know, very one way to a two way ex- ex- experiment. Let's go on. So we're going to, oh, we just tried that with this book for, for all those people watching. This book comes from StudyCat and it's a 14 part series on awesome books that you can use for your kids that also go in our apps. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so when you're reading, I'm going to show you some cool activities now and this is the fun part. I'm going to show you like seven activities that I guarantee you will use many, many, many times. So as I said before, think about what can you do before you read? What can you do during reading? And importantly, what can you do after reading? Mm -hmm. The book doesn't stop once you put it down, right? So let's go. So before, let's get to before first. So the first one I said was just predict. Of all the activities that I do with my daughter, I feel like predict prediction was the most exciting because they have the prediction and they find out the answer so it's almost like they're their own teacher and they just love it it's like it just allows their brains to go wherever they want them to go but we've talked about that one um first step is go through the story first I always do this and we're gonna the next activities are before you read go through the whole book do not read the words. So if you've got really big picture books, especially for your younger kids, do not read the words first. Because what you're going to do is you're going to teach them that you go left to right. There's things happening. They can guess what's happening. So here's my first activity. This one is called what can you see? What can you smell? What can you hear? Right? What can you see? What can you smell? What can you hear? So I just go through the book if everyone can see. And we know we're in a park. And we open the first page. As I say, what can you see? There's no, it, it doesn't matter if they get it wrong. Right? What can you see? It's so simple. <gasps> and they can say, oh, I can see three cats. I can see a blue cat. I can see a yellow cat. They might say, I can see a blue cat running. I can see a blue cat running next to a yellow cat and a pink cat. It doesn't matter because they're in control of what they're seeing, right? We just keep doing that as we go through. I can see a cat singing. They're, 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 they're starting to think and, and guess what they're saying. All the words they're saying are the words that are going to be in the book. Yeah. Right. So you've already got them thinking about those words. But then here comes the the one I love. Then you start saying, okay, what can you see? What can you smell? Mm. They don't just say, I can smell paper. You can start saying, I can smell the trees. Right. Oh, they smell, they, you know, I can smell this cat. He's yeah. a bit smelly, right? I can smell, and, and in other books, there'll be more to do. I can smell the water, right? Yeah. And then you start doing, what can you hear, right? And then it's, oh, I can hear, mummy, mummy, I can hear the cat singing. Yeah. I can hear the trampoline. What does it sound like? Boing, 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 boing. Yeah. I can hear the, oh, here's a good one. I can hear the splash. What does it sound like? Splash. So just by doing this, see, hear, smell. I, I don't do taste because it's not. <laughs> every time I do, what can you taste? The kids in my class would come up and try to lick the book. So we, we won't do that. But <laughs> my point, by doing this, what can you hear? What can you smell? What can you see? Again, you're activating all, all those words, but you're also getting them to think about it in other senses and that's how we live the world. And then that brings the book to life, right? Yep. So try that one first. So this is really cool. Before you've even started, what can you see? What can you smell? You have not read any words yet. Next. Yeah. This is my favorite or one of my favorites. This is called, I want you to find everything that is pink. And they open up the book. Or let's say everything that's yellow. And they, open, and they go, oh, yellow. And then they go through again, especially with young kids, yellow. Yeah. yeah, this way. Sorry. Uh, yellow, yellow. Oh, it's always the cat. You know, now it's like yellow, 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 yellow. But what they're doing is by doing that, they're turning the pages, they're finding things, and they're making that association. Yeah. Then here comes the fun bit. 
You can do that with characters. You can do that with words. And you can do that with letters. Now, parents, this is so simple. I just made these in, in one minute before. This says Tom, right? This says jump. This says yeah. this is an O. And this is an A. This takes 10 seconds, right? Or 20 seconds. You don't have to be artistic. And I'll say, okay, go find all the letter O's, right? And then what are you doing? You're giving them a prompt and they're finding them. Oh, look, O, O. And then you open up the next one. O, 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 O. And what you're doing now is you're actually starting to learn a reading skill. You're understanding the letter. You're going left to right. But it's a bit better than a comprehension, right? Like you're actually doing it with the book, right? And you're having some fun with it. And I promise you, if you play these games, then, you're, then your child will want to play the games the next yeah. time. You can do it with words. You can do it with letters. And what I do is, too, once they've found them, guess what they get to keep? They keep the, the card. <laughs> and then after a, a while, the, the kids have 50 cards that they've kept because they earned the cards. And then you ask your child to make cards and tell you to go find stuff in the book, right? Because then your child's engaging with the book. I love okay. that. It is a cool one. So that's before. So let's think what you can do. You can do a find things. You can do what can you see? What can you smell? What can you hear? And you haven't read a word yet. Yeah. Because there's so much more to engage in this book than reading the words. Now we're going to start reading. Okay. I love this one. So it's what you can you see again. But this time when they're reading, so I'll read a word, I'll read this out, right? Tom can't swim. And then you say, if you've got a little magnifying glass, just hand it to your kid and say, tell me what you can see on the screen. And they, they just love it. They go over the top and they're like, oh, look. He's swimming, he's in the water, but because it's so big, it's just another great way to engage with a book. So use a magnifying glass can, can turn reading in to one of the funnest activities you can do. So try that one out. Next and one. You know what's so great about kids' books too is I think illustrators and authors are, are very cognizant that kids want to find little things on the page. And so almost every children's book that we have, there's interesting little details that, you know, we read it a few times and then as a parent, you start to pick it up, but the kids get it the very first time. They're like, oh, look at the ladybug. So little on the, on the log. And you think, oh, so good that they did that. It is, it's so cool, right? And then they get this other passion for art and, and, and drawing yeah. as well. That's another whole thing that they might not have really thought about. Yeah. If you're just doing a comprehension on a piece of paper, right? Totally. Okay. Next thing is, I always love is while you're reading, you start to compare to real life. Now you probably do this already, but you know, is there one of these in your park? What's at your park? Is this the same as the park near your our house? What yeah. do you like doing in your park? Because that connection between the reading and real life makes kids realize that fiction, especially fiction is just a manifestation of real life, right? It's just an interpretation of real life. So they start to get make that connection and then they realise they can write a story about their favourite park, right? Because yeah. you've made that connection. Simple one to do, but a lovely way to talk about it. And then again, do you remember the what we just did with Race to Find? Now we do how many, right? So you say, okay, I want you to find the word jump. And while you're reading, you just say, count how many you can find. Yeah. So another, it's just so simple, right? But it's such a, they love it. They'll go, okay, I'll do it. And then they're playing with the book and they're finding it. Hey, if you're really busy, you can also do that. Right? You say, here's the book, here's the yeah. cards. Go tell me how many you can find. <laughs> but, but they'll love it. Like they'll, they'll sit there and be like, one, okay, two, three, four, or yeah. the characters or the objects. And then they're also doing a little bit of, um, uh, numeracy as well literacy and numeracy together a little bit not really well, I, I love that you're gamifying the book yeah why yeah. not right because yeah. then it's you know we, books are now here's the sad thing the books are competing with technology it's hard for them to make yeah. so let's make it a tactile interactive experience yeah the classic one that I'm sure all parents do is you know every book any decent kids book should have a twist at the end so in this one the twist is that Tom can do all these things. And then right at the end, here he throws his boomerang. And then right at the end, the boomerang hits him in the head and he can't catch. But what we should have done is what will happen next, right? So we don't, we just show them a little bit, but we don't let them know. 
and just a little bit. And again, they're predicting the end of the story. They're getting creative about what it might be. And then they find out. I mean, that's what all good kids books should do. Okay, so that's that. All right. Now we're going to go to after. <laughs> so what do you do after you read? Now, what I see most people do is they go good night and go to bed. Now, that's okay. Because that's what you a lot of people are reading to their kids to get them to sleep. My daughter falls asleep within the first two pages. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. Right? Great. She's asleep. I'm happy. Even though she's nine, I've still got to read to her. Anyway. Um, but the point is, what else can you do? So it's things like if you're doing it in the daytime, ask them to tell a friend about yeah. the book. I like, I mean, just so simple. Go tell a brother or sister about the book you read. You don't get involved because then they're in control. I'll go through these quite quickly in the essence of time. Um, of course, if you, if, you're, if you actually have time and you have things to cut out, of course, let them make a little play, exactly the same story. The only thing you have to do, though, is give them the time to watch the play. Now, I know parents are hard to find time, but if you let a child make a puppet show, for example, about the story they've just read, of course, they're going to want to do it. They're going to get engaged in it. And what they're doing is interpreting the book how they want to do it. They're going back to the book and looking at it. And it's and then it's a lot of fun, right, to do yeah. it at home if you have the time to sit and watch it, which I hope we do. And then the thing I really like is just telling parents to do this. Put the book away. Can't see the book now. And then just ask questions about the book. But remember, don't ask questions like, what did he do? It's what did you like? Who did you like? Would you do that? This, this, they're much more open-ended, right? Not yeah. why did he jump off the thing? Just tell me something that you liked about the story. Tell me something that you did that you saw in the story. So they're in control of that. And there's no wrong or right answer, right? It's just yeah. a discussion about the book, just like you would do if you recommended a book to a friend. Okay, yeah. a few more to go. This is my this is incredible. There is amazing research out of, I think it was out of Harvard or MIT, and it was actually done with science and experiments, but it's called the drawing effect. And they did it with that, but now they do it with reading. Kids who draw the story after, draw a character, draw something that happened, draw a scene from the story, are much more likely to remember the story than kids who just try to remember the story. Yeah. Drawing makes them have to think about what happened in the story. So draw the story, draw the characters, draw a scene. I mean, how nice is that? You finish your story and you say, here's a bit of paper, here's a pen. Can you draw me something from the story? Yeah. What do they have to do? They have to think about the story. Yeah. Perfect. Such simple thing to do. It's called the drawing effect. Evidence of reliable and robust memory benefits for free recall is the name of the paper. If anyone wants to look up the paper. <laughs> I like that you cited it. That makes sense though, Jake, because when I was in college, the way that I realized I learn is by listening to a lecture and then writing it down, not typing. I have to actually write it and then make flashcards. But it's sort of that like, you know, you listen, you hear, and then to help you memorize and retain the knowledge, you have yep. to actually write it down and think about yep. it. Yeah. And Lauren, even yeah. for anyone who is studying, they actually say make little diagrams is even more effective than just writing the notes. Wow. Because it you to think, how would this look? Yeah. Because you're manifesting it in a different way. Yep. Okay. Here, I know we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit over, but I think it's okay because it's, it's fine. It just we'll go we're five more minutes. Um, Perfect. Do this one. No, I, a lot of the parents in Asia, and that probably doesn't happen in America, will say. I've already read that book. So why are we reading it again? No. Yeah. Read the same book a hundred times if you want to. Because yeah. every time you read it, they'll find another thing. But here's the here's the key. It's called overlearning. What you're doing is every time you read it, you've made it easier for the child to read. So they'll start adding their own difficulty. They'll do something. They'll then they'll be able to make a play or draw a picture because now I understand the book even better. So the easy thing to do is just read again. Just say, go on tomorrow night. I'm sure you're aware of this one. Okay. I love this one. So if you get a big bit of paper, preferably Cute. A3, this is, I, I just put Haley's choice. My daughter is Haley. That's so adorable. All the stuff we've talked about, acting, acting out, reading again, writing, new book, draw it, ending, talk about it, sing it even, or a mystery one, which you don't tell her what it's going to be or him. 
<laughs> and every time you finish a book, if you do it in the daytime, you say, what do you want to do now? Do you want to act it out or read again? Do you want to draw it? And as they do it, what I make, what you can do if you have time or just tick it, you get like a, a, a tick and stick it on, right? So we've done act it out now. I want you to do something else with the next book because then you're mixing it up, right? But who gets to choose? Your child gets to choose, not you, the child. Then they draw it. Then they read. Then they do a new ending, maybe. They do a sing it, right? And then yeah. after you've filled up all nine, what do they get? Maybe they get like a, they get to go and buy a new book maybe, right? Like, yeah, there's some lovely idea. reward, right? But yeah. now it's something that they've chosen. They are in control. So it's called a choice board. Most teachers have these, but it's something you can have at home. Such a simple thing to have, right? So cute. I love that. So that's called the choice board. Okay, last thing, a few final thoughts for you, and I'll just go through this because it's it's just a few tips from the top. No, not, not that I'm on top. A few tips from understanding. So <laughs> remember, you all know this of all, but all neuroscientists, David Sousa, everyone says the same thing. Reading aloud to your child is one of the best ways to learn to read. It's just that, that they understand, they're seeing the words go along, they're going from left to right, all that stuff. So I think most people know this one, right? Yeah. Um, really interestingly, though, there was a study earlier this year. Um, it was actually made by Ladybird Publishing. So they said, commission this study, and 33% of parents under five said they didn't have enough confidence to read to their kids because mm -hmm. they don't want to do all the silly voices and stuff. Um, I, I, I mean, I, it's interesting to see this research and you know, obviously, the sillier you can be, the more engaged you can be with it, it's fine. If there are parents who are really afraid of it, I mean, YouTube is an amazing resource at the moment. There, I, I don't think there is a book that hasn't been read by some amazing reader. So if I, I don't think it's a bad thing to have the book on a screen and then the book in their hand, right? And someone's yeah. reading it to them. So that's a nice way, especially if you don't have time. Yeah. Anyway. Just to be aware, lots of parents feel this ne this nervousness with reading, but they shouldn't. Um, and here's the point, because just 10 minutes a day makes a difference. Yeah. So let's have a quick final test for everybody. So does everyone know the impact of reading 20 minutes a day out there? Here it is. If you read one minute a day, just one minute a day, that's 8,000 words per year that you'll read. If you read five minutes a day, it doesn't, it's an exponential growth of reading. It's yeah. not like five times eight, it's 280,000. This is a very famous research from the 80s that's been replicated many times. But if you read 20 minutes a day, which is tough, actually, 20 minutes is quite tough. Using things like Raz Kids is really good for that, or even if you can't use the books, is how much do you think it is, Lauren? Well, if it's like 3x, um, you're talking like 800,000? Actually, 1.8. <laughs> so <laughs> now, look, no, even if you just do 10 minutes, you're going to be hitting a million words a year. So the key to getting your child to read is reading more, getting that little chance while you can and, and, and interacting with them. Right, I'm going quite quickly now, but one of the questions that parents always ask me as we're wrapping up, is how do I know which book to choose for my child? There are two schools of thoughts. I agree with both the schools of thought. The first school of thought is the five-finger test. Now, this is if you want to pick a book at their level. You, you open the first page of the book. Now, this one doesn't have enough in it, but maybe once they're seven or eight, and you start counting. If there's five words that they don't know on that page, that book is too difficult for your child. So say there's 100 words on a page. The theory says, by a very, very famous reading researcher called Paul Nation, that if you have five, um, if, there are, if there's too many book words they don't know, they, they won't get anything from the book. It'll just be a struggle for them, right? That's the theory. Um, I agree with this. I've seen it happen where kids are constantly stopping. They don't get to read fluently. It's very difficult. So they call the five-finger test. I'm not. I, I, as a teacher, I'm not 100% into this. It, yeah. It's a great theory and it's good if you're really wondering where is my child's reading level. On the other side is let them choose. So the other, yeah. the flip side is go to the library and let them choose. Guess what? If they choose a book that's too hard, fine. 
they'll still interact with the book and have some sort of and they'll realize it's too hard the next yeah. time they go back they'll choose a book that's too easy and then eventually they'll start choosing books that they want to push themselves at okay so yeah. both both is okay and I, I like that you brought that up though because my son who's eight when he was five he watched the chronicles of narnia whoa the lion the, lion, the witch in the wardrobe that's the yeah yeah and he wanted to read the book and so my mom gifted it for christmas and I don't know if you've read that book. It is but very advanced. And so very. We, yeah, we read it to him. And I would say he probably picked up about 30%, but he talks about it a lot. Well, that's when great. I, yeah. yeah. Like you remember that book where they go through the closet into another world. And it's so it's interesting the things he was picking up. Um, but I, I sort of experienced firsthand what you're talking about, where the book was obviously too advanced, but he still sort of enjoyed the story. I don't know how yeah. much out of it but he sort of remembers so it was kind of like a sweet memory yeah a lot of schools now will have this rule that your child's not allowed to read harder books because we're in this grade now and this is the level we read obviously that's just silly right obviously you should let kids try to read harder books and work it out for themselves so mm -hmm. if, if anyone's teachers tell them no, no no but they're not at that level yet well maybe just sort of try to encourage them to let them try, right? Because then you, what you're telling your kid is don't try and read more difficult books. Totally. There's no point. Like, that's just silly, right? Okay, this is it. We're about to finish. What is the most important factor in your child's reading journey? I'm going to show you a picture if anyone's watching. This is an issue at the moment, okay? Yeah. Right, I'm going to show you the solution for this. So I see that this is what's happening all the time. And it's amazing how many parents tell their kids, you're not allowed to be on your phone. You're not allowed to be on your on your iPad. Mm. But they sit there the whole time on their phones and iPads, right? So I'm not saying that being on a phone or iPad is bad for a kid at all. I work for an app company. I think apps can be amazing for kids, right? But this is not a good look. The, yeah. the child's not allowed to use it, but the parents are. So I'm not saying that's what that's the solution. Then I see this. One solution is this. Yeah. But I'm not saying this is a great solution either because then it's just everyone's not, there's no interaction, <coughs> everyone's staring at their phones. I think this is better than this. This is telling a child, you don't get to do this. This is saying, well, at least you can do something. And look, there's so many amazing reading apps out there, so many cool things you can do that might encourage them to read. But I also think that this is a huge problem that parents spend, and I'm a guilty so much time on our phones that uh, what aren't kids seeing they're not seeing this yeah so my number one tip for all parents if you watch this at some point yeah. is be seen reading be mm. a model reader kids want to be like their parents and then you wonder why they want to use their tablets or phones because we're on our phones and on our tablets. We're on the train, we're on our phones. We're even in the car and we're on our phones. And then the kids want to be on their phones. Be seen reading. I'm sure when Lauren and I grew up, well, and Lauren's obviously younger than I am, but when we grew up, <laughs> our parents didn't have phones to be on. That's My mum always had three books on the coffee table and she was always reading one of them. And she used to read like this. She'd lie down and read. Who cares if you're lying down to read? Who cares if you're lounging around reading? But if your child wakes up in the morning and sees you reading or when you're going to bed, you're reading, they, they make an association with reading that it's a positive thing that my mum and dad do. So That's number so one tough. tip, be That's seen so reading. Tough. I love this, but it's so like I read on my Kindle, which is well, awesome. And, and so I like that you said this because maybe I will buy a few books, paperbacks, just to have them to show my kids, just to be a model for my kids that it doesn't always have to be on a screen yeah well a kindle is at least it's quite obviously not an ipad which is good and i'm not i'm not against screens i think i think that to, for everybody i think that uh tablets and screens are, are the biggest revolution in education we've had in 100 years they're going to change the way kids learn and our kids will be far smarter than us in 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 so many ways maybe not in the way that they interact outside but just their abilities on and their, their access to knowledge and everything. I think that people are very negative about screens. And I think it's silly. I think it's, it's, it's just that we've got to be more aware of how they use screens. But 
also buy books, like you said, and be seen reading, right? Just yeah. so you know, book sales have not dropped in the last 10 years. They've gone up in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bit of a myth that no one reads books anymore. That's not true. People do read books. Books do get read and people are buying more books. It, it's at, at maybe as a challenge to the screens. So let's see what happens. Yeah. That's it. I love that. Jake, thank you so much. I can't believe how much you jam packed in 30 minutes. 34 minutes, but that's 34 okay. 34 minutes. <laughs> I, I know. I, I shouldn't have put so much in, but I but listen, I hope we can do this again and we'll do something on phonics and I'll show you a hundred games at home which will help you. It's so great, Jake. Thank you so much. And um if possible, we could PDF this presentation and send it to our attendees who registered, and that would be awesome. Uh Jake from Study Cat, Lauren from Maple. Thank you everybody for coming. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye from Shanghai.